Good morning, Advent. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, whose steadfast love is everlasting, whose faithfulness endures from generation to generation. Amen. Trusting in the mercy of God, let us confess our sin. Reconciling God, we confess that we do not trust your abundance and we deny your presence in our lives. We place our hope in ourselves and rely on our own efforts. We fail to believe that you provide enough for all. We abuse your good creation for our own benefit. We fear difference and do not welcome others as you have welcomed us. We sin in thought, word, and deed. By your grace, forgive us. Through your love, renew us, and in your spirit, lead us, so that we may live and serve you in newness of life. Amen. Beloved of God, by the radical abundance of divine mercy, we have peace with God through Christ Jesus, through whom we have obtained grace upon grace. Our sins are forgiven. Let us live now in hope, for hope does not disappoint, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also Let us pray. O oh God, on this day you open the hearts of your faithful people by sending into us your Holy Spirit. Direct us by the light of that Spirit, that we may have a right judgment in all things and rejoice in all times in your peace. Through Jesus Christ, your Son and our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. A reading from Acts. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues, as of fire, 
appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Or a ce moment, des Juifs pu, venu de chez tout le peuple du monde, séjourné à Jérusalem. En entendant ces bruits, il a couru en foule inférent, cessé du stupère. En effet, chacun de les entendait parler sans sa propre langue. Dans leur entendement, il n'en croyait pas lu, aurait aidé. Voyez, ces gens qui parlent, n'en viennent-ils pas tout de Galilée? Comment se fait-il donc que nous les entendons, si primés chacun dans notre langue maternelle? Nous sommes part, mais O Elimit, nous habitons Mesopotamie, la Judée, la Cappadoce, la Pont ou la Provence d'Assie, la Phrygie ou la Pompée, Égypte ou la Territoire, de la, la Libye, près de Sérène. Où ben nous vivons à Rome, nous sommes juifs de naissance ou par conversion. Nous venons de la Crète ou de la Rab. Et pourtant, chacun de nous les entend parler dans sa propre langue, des choses merveilleuses que Dieu a accompli. Il y a une grande og folk råbte i munden på hinanden, hvad sker der? Men de, der ikke forstod ordene, gjorde nar af disciplinen. De har bare drukket for meget vin, råbte de. Da tårte Peter frem, og de andre elve apostler stillede sig ved siden af ham. Han råbte til folkemængden, hør efter alle i jøder, og I som bor i Jerusalem. Det er ikke sandt, som nogen af jer siger, at de har mennesker, der har drukket sig fulde. Klokken er jo kun ni om formiddagen. En realitet, lo que pasa, er slo, lo que anuncio el profeta jo. Suicidera, que en los últimos días, dice Dios, derame mi espíritu sobre todo el género humano. Los hijos y los hijas de Ustedes profetizaron, tendrán visiones los jóvenes y sueños los ancianos. En esos días derame mi espíritu, on sobre mis siervos y mis siervas y profetizaron. And I will show portents in the heaven above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and smoky mist, as the sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood, before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Please join me in reading Psalm 104, 24 to 35b, read responsively. How manifold are your works, O Lord? In wisdom you have made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. Yonder is the sea, great and wide, with its swarms to many to number, living things both great and great. There go the ships to and fro, and Leviathan, which you have made for the sport of it. All of them look to you to give them their food in due season. You will give it to them, they gather it, you open your hand, and they are filled with good things. When you hide your face, they are terrified. When you take away their breath, they die and return to their dust. You send forth your spirit, and they are created, and so you renew the face of the earth. 
May the glory of the Lord endure forever. O Lord, rejoice in all your works. You look at the earth and it trembles. You touch the mountains and they smoke. I will sing to the Lord as long as I live. I will praise my God while I have my being. May these words of mine please God. I will rejoice in the Lord. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Alleluia. A reading from 1 Corinthians 12, 4 to 13. No one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit, and there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the name of the same God who activates all of them in every one. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. To one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to, the, to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by one Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another the sermon of spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, to another the in interpretations of tongues. All these are activated by one, the same Spirit, who allots to each one individually must as the Spirit chooses. For just as a body is one and has many members, and all of the members of one body through many are one body, so it is with Christ. For in the one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and we are all made to drink of one spirit. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to St. John. Glory to you, O Lord. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews. Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, I'd like to invite the children to come forward at this point to be able to have the opportunity to hear the children's chat, so I'll give you just a little bit of time if you're not already in the living room or in the family room ready to listen to what it is that I might be able to share with you on this day. Good morning, children. It's good to be able to have the chance to have a talk with you. And today I'd like to talk or at least begin our time together with Dr. Seuss. I don't know whether Dr. Seuss is one of your favorite readers or authors to read. My guess is that it probably is, and he is certainly one of my favorite writers. And in one book that is a particularly dear one to me, which is entitled, Oh, the Places You Will Go, and maybe you know about that book, he says this, today you are you. That is truer than true. There is no one alive who is youer than you. I love that because it talks about how it is that each one of us is special. There is no one else in the world that is exactly like you. God made you special. There is only one of you. And the one of you that there is is someone who has gifts, things that they are good at, talents, the ways that they are able to be a part of this world and share the good things that are in their lives with one another. And I know that you have those very special aspects about your living. 
Maybe some of you are good readers. Maybe some of you can run very, very fast. Maybe there are others of you who know how to play a musical instrument or love to sing. Maybe some of you are caring and want to sit and show love for someone when they're feeling sad. Those are all things that make you, you. Not everybody has the same things that set you apart, but because you have them, we give thanks because we believe, as Jesus' people, that God is the one who gives us those very things that we can use in this world to take care of each other. So when you think about that phrase again, that you are you and there is no one else quite like you, I want you to think about how God has been good to you and to me and to everyone in this world to share those important gifts that he has given us through the gift of the Holy Spirit. God knew exactly what God was doing by putting you in this world to share what he has given you for the sake of the love of Jesus Christ. Let's bow our heads, children, and let's talk to God. Thank you, God, for giving us gifts and talents, things that we're good at. Thank you for making us who we are and understanding that we are, there is no one else in this world that is quite like us. Help us to share those good gifts that you have given us and remind us always that we are your children. Amen. Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and our Lord and risen Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. This is one of the most valuable antiques that I have. It doesn't look very antique does it? It doesn't look like it's anything particularly special. It is a pestle that my mother used when she would grind meat for homemade sausage. On occasion, she would also use this very same pestle to make chopped liver. Now, this belonged to my mother. I have been willed this heirloom, and I have to tell you I cherish it very, very much. It isn't made of gold. You can't shine it up and make it look like it is more than what it really is, something that's used to push the chunks of meat through the hand-cranked grinder that you, some of you know, is the sort of thing that was fastened onto the edge of a counter and had to be screwed in place, and it had to take manual labor to be able to make that ground meat. So in that respect, it's really not that big of a deal. It means something to me, however, because it reminds me of how I am connected to my family, and it also reminds me of what it means to use gifts for the sake of the welfare of a family. Now, I do not typically walk around with this hunk of wood in my hand, and I don't usually walk around and fawn over it and tell everybody that I meet how wonderful it is and how no one has anything even remotely like this, because I know that's not true. And even in the unlikely event that someone dropped into my life and told me that this hunk of wood was worth a lot of money if I were to sell it, I wouldn't do that. It's a symbol that points to something that is much larger than personal wealth or personal gain. It connects me to a larger agenda. It symbolizes that I belong, that I have a gift, and that I can use this gift for good. Now, I might add, I did not earn this gift. There is no way for me to fasten this around my neck, run a chain around it, or anything like that, so I can't wear it like it's a medal. It would look a little ridiculous even if I did try that. So it stands to reason that what I have been given what I did not earn by any extraordinary act of my own is not and never was about 
me. The gift has always been about someone else, and in fact, a lot of someone else's. It has and has the capacity to create a legacy of sorts. This helped put food on my family's table when I was growing up. That, in turn, put one family into the global mix of trillions of other families, all unleashed, to make an impact on the world. It also connects one generation with generations before and, hopefully, generations beyond this. All of it for the sake of receiving a blessing, free, undeserved, and blessing others with this same free, an undeserved gift of grace. And that, my dear friends, is what the church is all about. The church is the body of Christ, created, breathed into life by the gift of the promised Holy Spirit. A body is made up of many parts, all of them with a distinct function and purpose, but working together for the sake of the whole body. The free gifts given to those who comprise Christ's body are, in turn, then passed along for the sake of the world, blessed in order to be a blessing. So with that said, let's talk about the church in the city of Corinth, as it was in the early days of the Christian movement. To understand what was going on in Corinth, you have to understand the human need to stake a claim on self-defined importance. The Corinthian Christians were all jazzed about receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit. Of course they were. Who wouldn't be? As it should be. But this spiritual enthusiasm has a shadow side to it. The human propensity for neatly categorizing all things under the headings of good, better, and best made community life more than just a bit contentious among Christ's people in Corinth. And so with that in mind, the essential question becomes, are some manifestations of the Holy Spirit superior to others? Stated another way, are my spiritual gifts better or worse than yours? Am I a better and a more faithful, card-carrying, spirit-toting Christian than you because I have a certain skill set or certain spiritual gifts and you don't? That God was and is generous in the outpouring of the Holy Spirit should be gift enough for us to stand on our own without any kind of qualifiers. And let me be clear, the qualifiers are the things that we impose upon those gifts. But from the start, and especially as it connects with the Corinthian church, faithful followers of Jesus kept tinkering with this spiritual evidence of God's grace and they didn't make anything much better in the process. Instead, they undermined or threatened to undermine the unity of the Holy Spirit, which is the Spirit's first and best gift. All gifts are given for a purpose. While they are signs of grace, the best gifts also set both giver and recipient on a path to putting the gifts to the best possible use. It is about a gift that is also a blessing. It is never about the gift that is my personal property or as some sort of sign of entitlement. So, what did Paul have to say about all of this? Well, in typical Paul fashion, he had plenty to say. In doing so, he attempted to establish a very clear criteria for how followers of Jesus consider and put to the test each spiritual gift, with the understanding that those spiritual gifts are free, undeserved. It is never enough to simply state that what you have received has come from God. 
That claim, as it is shared within the community, and as it benefits the whole body of Christ, that needs to be evaluated and tested. Paul began with the name of Jesus in today's reading. It would seem that the first and the most important measure of the Holy Spirit at work in the heart of the believer is found in Jesus' own name, how it is used, the claims made through Christ's name, how the gospel connects words and actions in the name of Jesus. In short, is your spiritual gift about Christ, or has it become more about you? Second, gifts are given for the common good. God's grace pulls us together. It does not distinguish between good, better, and best. All gifts move God's people as a unit in the same direction. What we do with all of that is always what we do together in the name of the risen Christ. And the third test of how we understand the presence of the Holy Spirit is, well, there's no way to say it nicely. It is that the work of the Holy Spirit in the church is messy. It is. It is messy because the world is messy. You don't have to make your own sausage, you know. It's neater and cleaner to go to Giant and buy it. But the labor of mission in the name of Christ means that we get to go out in this messy, turbulent world and make a different kind of mess with a whole different set of messy priorities. Priorities like loving your neighbor, compassion, kindness, justice, seeing grace and gifts in the ways the world doesn't see, or if it does see, does not acknowledge. Messy grace creates and unites communities of different people from different places with different gifts and with different languages. The common denominator in all of it is the proclamation of the gospel. But any time you deal with people, which is the same as saying that any time we become embroiled in our own flawed humanity, things get messy. But grace is found in the midst of that turbulence and in the, in the midst of that mess. And Christ's spiritual DNA is deep in our bones and deep in our hearts and more deeply in the communities breathed into existence by Christ's spirit. You know, I still sometimes look at this pestle and I wonder just how much family DNA has collected in this wood. Now, you've probably all figured out in the almost two years that I've been here that I am inclined to overthink a lot of things. But bear with me on this. My mother held this kitchen tool, and so did my grandmother. The sweat and the oil from their hands is embedded in this wood, and it is now mine. I don't use this. I'm pretty sure that the sanitation police would probably arrest me if I even tried to use this because it's pretty unclean. But it reminds me of the legacy of grace. Gifts are messy if you risk using them. The spirit will always blow where it wills. But somehow the church lives. In spite of us most of the time, it lives because of Christ and not because of us. It began in the messiness of Christ's death and the audacious and messy claim of Christ's resurrection. And that start, started the whole thing, breathed into life by the Holy Spirit. It was evidenced in the whirlwind of Pentecost. And it goes on today and tomorrow and forever. Amen. Uplifted by the promised hope of healing and resurrection, we join the people of God in all times and in all places. 
in praying for the church, the world, and all who are in need. We call on your spirit of unity, giving thanks for our different vocations. Activate and utilize the diverse gifts present in your church that they reveal your love for all. Lord, in your mercy, we call on your spirit of life, present in air, wind, humidity, storms, and oxygen in our atmosphere, breathing energy into all things. Heal with your breath the whole creation. Lord, in your mercy, we call on your spirit of righteousness. Wherever we as a people are divided, unite us. Wherever we are prideful, humble us. Give each one of us a heart for justice and empathy. Lord, in your mercy, we call on your spirit of healing. Bless nurses, doctors, midwives, respiratory therapists, chaplains, counselors, hospice workers, and all who work toward the healing of our world in these difficult times. Lord, in your mercy, we call on your spirit of patience and mercy. Help us to see the good in all people. Give us compassionate hearts to reach out in love to those who are hurting or in need. Lord, in your mercy, we call on your spirit of hope. As you have led your saints in times and places, stir in us the desire to follow their example, leading us from death to new life in you. Lord, in your mercy, with bold confidence in your love, almighty God, we place all for whom we pray into your eternal care. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you always. Amen.
Go in peace. Serve the Lord.